welcome to episode number 18 of Performing Labor. My name is Rob Simons, and I am your host. This podcast features interviews with accomplished performing musicians who are doing interesting and creative work from within performing arts institutions and outside of them. We'll unpack their training, their practice, and their careers, how they got started, how they stay sharp, and their ambitions for the future. And it's my hope that these interviews will provide value if you're thinking about a career in music, if you're in music school now, a working musician, or if you're a music lover and just curious to learn more. My guest this week is my Rochester Philharmonic Orchestra colleague, Grace Browning. Grace is the principal harpist of both the RPO and the Santa Fe Opera in New Mexico, and she recently began teaching at the University of Denver. The New Jersey native attended the Eastman School of Music here in Rochester and is a graduate of the University of Michigan and the Juilliard School. She was a fellow at the New World Symphony in Miami, and prior to winning the RPO position, she was the principal harpist of the Dallas Opera. The New Yorker has remarked on her starkly beautiful playing. The South Florida Classical Review has noted her nimble dexterity, tonal radiance, and sensitive musicianship. Grace and I began working together in September of 2019 when I joined the RPO. She's a magnetic performer and a gifted communicator who is always seeking to make a greater connection with her audience. But like much of American life, the orchestra's in-person performing schedule came to a sudden stop in March because of COVID-19. Yet in some ways, the adaptations we've made to the health crisis are how I really got to know Grace. In such as it's possible, Grace has thrived during this crisis, both spearheading and facilitating artistic and development projects for the orchestra, even amidst the pandemic's most uncertain days. I've worked with a few types of musicians who are also effective leaders offstage. They fall into a few categories. There are those who I think of as stopped clocks, the type that have only one setting, but are right twice a day. Then there are those that are flexible and mold themselves to whatever the situation demands. And then there are those like Grace who have a vision that also meets the times. They have the perseverance to see long changes through, the ability to know or intuit what they can impact and have the temperament to manage the administrative and interpersonal details that are essential to a collective artistic enterprise. Something that I recently read came to mind while reflecting on this, the Marine Corps doctrinal publication, Warfighting, which by the way, is an incredible book on organizational theory. In there are the concepts of areas of interest versus areas of influence that are key to understanding and operating in a dynamic system. Quote, we must therefore be prepared to cope even better to thrive in an environment of chaos, uncertainty, constant change, and friction. In practical terms, this means that we must not strive for certainty before we act, for in doing so, we will pass up opportunities. Long before the coronavirus, Grace forwarded her vision for an institution that tells the message of its musicians, lifts up its audience, plays the role of educational partner, and one that seeks out connections with audiences in new ways, in person and online. But when our organization could have gone silent, Grace seized an opportunity to build a platform that gave life to more than two dozen stream performances by the RPO, facilitated the creation and distribution of hundreds of videos that were the public face of the orchestra, And this work continues even as we have resumed some concert operations. And thinking into the future, Grace touches on the idea that there are more options than just Pops and Classical. But I think it's important to remember that at one time, Pops was a major innovation. And since then, the industry has made many marginal changes and improvements, but nothing on that scale. And perhaps this rethinking of how large institutions deliver classical music deliver music education, and how we define our audience might be that major shift that could be just around the corner. And finally, this will be the last performing labor episode before the election. My profession, this profession, would not be, well, a profession if it weren't for organized labor. This art form and the institutions that produce it 
benefit from the professionalization and commitment to workers that unionization and collective bargaining deliver. And as this industry that is both uniquely suffering and one that is full of resilient institutions and individuals tries to plot a path forward, voting is non-negotiable. If we are to rebuild together as musicians, as union members, as music lovers, as American citizens, please vote and vote for something better. Please enjoy this interview with Grace Browning. Grace Browning, welcome to the podcast. Thank you for joining me. <laughs> Thank you so much for having me. I am a huge fan. Uh, <laughs> really love, love your podcast and bravo to you for like saying you're going to do it and also actually doing it really, really well. It's been so fun to uh, stay connected with you in this way. So yeah, thank well, you. You've been an inspiration in that regard, Grace. Oh. So well, you just got back to Rochester from Denver, Denver University, where you started a new job. And you did that in person. And given what an incredible advocate you've been for organizations adapting and using technology to spread the message, their message online in any way possible, I'm curious about what it was like to take that to a brand new institution for yourself, given all that you've learned over these past seven months or so. Yeah, totally. Great question. It was certainly an unexpected venture. Um, I basically got a phone call from the the teacher who's taking a year off there, my good, my dear friend, Anne-Marie Liss, who's been struggling with Lyme's disease. So when I originally accepted the job, it was really only at the time going to be remote because, you know, it's quarantine and that's what most people are doing. And I live in Rochester. But after I started working with the students, now, again, there are only actually two HARP students there, but they are both second year master's students. Mm -hmm. And one of them is graduating early this semester. So I was like, okay, we, we really got to get going. So, you know, so we started virtually. And, and again, thanks to everything we've done over the last seven months, um, you know, I had all the equipment, I had this nice microphone, I, you know, we know how to do high quality streaming and, and Zoom and all that, but there were still things that I was struggling to, to share with them, particularly in regards to technique and body tension, which is just, as it turns out, sort of the, the bane of every musician's existence is how do you deal with that, particularly when, you know, uh, performance anxiety gets into the picture, all of that. And so here are two women who, again, they're actually both like 29 and 32 years old. So they have been doing this for a while and they are ready to go, like ready to start a career. So Another big thing that I was just thinking about was how can I equip them, um, not only just with the tools needed for this very interesting career that, that we have as, you know, orchestral musicians, but also beyond that, because as we've seen, we have to be able to do a lot more than just play our instruments. We have to engage audiences. We have to know how to teach. We have to know how to put on concerts, um, how to represent ourselves on social media, having a website, you know, all of these things. So basically ended up when I, when I, when I realized I had time to go out and see them because I, there was no harp in the first two months of the RPO programming. I thought, well, I'm just going to, you know, we would just spend all day together, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, <laughs> and, you know, and just dive into all this stuff. Because even though everything is sort of on pause, it's also a great opportunity to take the time to, um, you know, fix those things in your playing that you just never really wanted to dig into, um, and to build up these skills that we, we now need for the very uncertain future. These two students, so they said you're, they're 29, 32 years old. Had they been out in the world working and came back to school? To some extent, one of them actually switched instruments a few times, which is amazing. And again, I wish that we could have that kind of fluency. You know, she did jazz piano for a while. Wow. She also sang. So a part of what I wanted to do was, was also sort of help her wrap her mind around that and I think in a way she sort of maybe had a chip on her shoulder like oh, you know if only I had stuck with harp this whole time it would have been so much better and I'm like well actually if you took seven years to work on jazz piano that means you're a pretty dope musician and your ears are probably amazing mm -hmm. so we can use that you know <laughs> 
And then she would like, you know, we would have warm up class together and she would like lead us in like an improvisation or something, you know, cause I'm like, that is awesome stuff. I wish I could do that. And having the skills to improvise or to, you know, play along by ear, that's something that again, in the classical world, it's not necessarily part of our package, part of our necessary skills, but it's really helpful to have in whatever other circumstances. Mm -hmm. So how do you see then that those, all these things you just articulated, how, how might they be institutionalized into the curriculum mm -hmm. of a music program going forward? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that is a great question. And um, it's something that actually they've already been thinking about, which is great. I had a conversation with the dean there, uh, Keith Ward, and he's uh, um, he just joined the school two years ago. And you can imagine there's been a lot to take care of over the last couple of months. And I'll just say right off the bat, I, I really applaud them and all of the universities who are doing everything they can do to stay safe, to adapt to COVID protocols and give their students the chance for in-person learning. So that, again, like I was so impressed by that. But another thing that they are launching is an entrepreneurship certificate. Um, and it's still sort of in the making, but we had a faculty meeting the other day talking about like, well, what is going to be a part of this, you know, because it's, it's a huge opportunity. And again, what was quote unquote needed even a year ago or five years ago, it's going to be really different um, from probably the skills that we need now. So one huge topic of that is PR, you know, um, and how musicians are really in a great position to do their own PR because as musicians, we can figure out, you know, what is the real juice to the program that we're delivering? You know, what makes this piece that we're working on or whatever we're sharing relevant and meaningful? So giving us the tools to share our music and our message is so important. And, you know, that's why social media is just such a gift. Yeah, social media certainly has been a really good thing for a lot of people. It's also obviously had a lot of uh, very <laughs> negative societal consequences yeah. too, but I mean, it is something that oh my gosh. technology itself is fairly neutral and the way you use it is up to, is up to us. Absolutely. I'm curious though about this entrepreneurship credential or certificate. Um, did you find that the conversations around that are very COVID specific? Obviously, you said that this had been in the works for a little while. We're talking about marketing and getting mm -hmm. your getting the word out about yourself. But right. is there a sense that this pandemic has changed the way they see that? Or is this sort of a temporary um, hurdle to get across? I think that this is something that, yeah, has been in the works for longer. And most likely COVID was a catalyst for this, meaning, okay, now let's really think about what we're equipping our students with as they graduate with a degree in music. Are they going to be able to transition that into work? I think, you know, so again, um, having that online presence is huge, but also, I mean, as we can learn from Eastman right here, their um, um, arts and leadership program was one of the first programs to, to really give students the career advice that they needed. And I, I was really lucky also to have that at Juilliard. And the best thing about this too, and that I'll always remember is that my teacher at, at Juilliard who taught this class, um, her name's uh, Barely Nugent. Um, she was also the Dean of Chamber Music, I think. She was the first teacher to ask her, uh, me to make a website. And again, this was, this was a part of our curriculum. You know, we had to learn how to do a press kit, how to write our bios, all this stuff. And she said, and now, you know, make a website. And I remember at first I just looked at her like, are you kidding? Like, I'm a harpist. Why would I make a website? And I mean, I knew people could do it, but I thought, no way. So I don't actually think I finished the website in the term um, oh, that I was there. But like months later, I sent her an email and I said, hey, guess what? I finally did it. <laughs> and we you know we kept in touch. And then years after that, she re received my first MailChimp newsletter. And just having that support, you know, down the road and someone to say, even for me, like, honestly, when I was in school, I felt like I was nobody. I'm in a sea of the most amazing students, like maybe in the world. And I mean, I honestly felt like it was like an accident that I got in. Anyway, so I had to battle all of these sort of demons like we all do. And so having someone say, yeah, you, you have a brand and you have a message and you need to share it and here's how to do that really 
made me, um, it, it will sort of force me <laughs> to put myself out there. Um, so having the tools to do that and the support saying, yeah, you're worth this was, um, was really huge. Not to put you on the uh, couch too much here, but why do you think, where do you think that impulse in classical music comes from to be so leery of um, putting yourself out there under your own name? It's so tough. And again, like we were just talking about social media and it's funny because a lot of people say, Grace, you're so good at social media. And I'm like, but I hate myself every time I post. <laughs> I really do. I'm like, nobody cares. Like, why? <laughs> you know, I'm so selfish. And so we all have to battle that. And I mean, I remember too, like years ago, what was it? Like I was in, um, you know, an English class and we, we had this, this teacher who asked us all to um, say something positive about ourselves to the other person. And I remember we all just sort of sat there like sheep, like, oh, well, I, I mean, I, I guess I'm sort of good at, I play the harp and, uh, you know, but <laughs> saying, you know, saying good things about ourselves um, doesn't really seem to come naturally, especially when as musicians, we're trained to constantly critique ourselves. We have to be listening back to everything we're doing and saying what's not good. <laughs> but by that same token, we also need to be saying, you know, what it is good. You know, I've often thought about that culture that we've, we've been steeped in since we were kids, all of us, no matter what generation of musicians we are in, that part of that comes from, I think, the fear of being the person that doesn't know their level. Right. So like being so being unaware of where you fit in would be like the worst way to call yourself out. So I think as a protection mechanism, we don't ever risk putting ourselves out there. The flip side of that, of course, yep. though, is that I think it was in Arnold Steinhardt's biography, um, The Indivisible by Four. He wrote about how in music school, you're only good if an empowered person or teacher says that you're good. So the, the way the pecking order kind of gets established is by which studio you're in or what opportunities you get. And that actually doesn't come from an honest appraisal of your communication skills as an artist or as just a, as, a, as a human. So how do you see, do you think that this, the, the age of social media also combined with the intersection of the pandemic might just force us as an as a, as a industry to be able to speak about ourselves and our accomplishments and our message a little bit more succinctly and clearly? Yeah, that would be great. I mean, as you're saying, there's so much out there right now and so much <clears throat> disinformation and, you know, and, and hate and a lot of darkness. So as musicians, it is our job to put out beautiful, inspiring work. And that is what I always have to come back to is that it's not about me. None of this is about me. Mm -hmm. I am just a vessel for my art and I have that gift that I can share that. So I need to get over myself <laughs> and just do it. But you know, it's really hard and it took me so, so long to get here. And I, I mean, I still, I mean, I have a lot of anxiety. I've always had anxiety and I think it's helpful to understand where that anxiety comes from, especially when you're dealing with performance anxiety. You know, it comes from that flight or fight instinct, you know, from way back when. And, um, you know, when we sense a threat, your, our, our left brain, you know, and even our amygdala, amygdala too, the emotional response is triggered. And it says, watch out. You are not safe right now. Get out of here. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and that's when the other side of our brain has to come in and, and, you know, and come back to the present and to the art and the music. And, and then, you know, again, at least that's how I, that's how I always have to center myself. So I think if we can fight that negative voice um, and then just always ask ourselves like, well, what am I really putting out with this content? What am I accomplishing with this? You know, even having a checklist like Joshua Roman, the wonderful, cellist and you know curator and everything he um he and i were talking about this and he actually has a checklist like is it inspiring is it beautiful does it entertain or you know does it i think something like does it teach something so um or oh no no actually it was does it pique curiosity and I love that because it's really thinking about more of the service that you're providing and the interaction with the other person that's a really interesting idea 
Have you created your own checklist? No, but I need to. <laughs> I need to. I mean, um, I, I think the, you know, the other things that just really haunt us as musicians are, of course, just having, um, when we are scrolling, it's impossible to not compare yourself, you know, mm -hmm. seeing what other people are doing and then measuring yourself. But as, you know, Noah Kagiyama says, the wonderful performance psychologist, you know, if in comparison, no matter what, you'll always find someone better and you'll always find someone worse. <laughs> and, you know, getting over that sort of, um, you know, imposter syndrome is, you know, I think which is one of the only ways we can, we can move forward. It would be a really interesting exercise to put that checklist together because it would be different for each person. Although I'm sure there'd be a lot of similarities between performer to performer. I mean, the obvious thing that comes to mind for me is the Atul Gawande's book, The Checklist Manifesto, right? That you have this list of this incredibly succinct list that keeps you from making stupid mistakes and get, keeps you yeah. on, on, on track. I wonder about yeah. how that might be applied to artists. I do want to take a little bit of a branch here though and ask, mm -hmm. When it comes to performance anxiety, is it somewhat context dependent for you? I did a, an audition class recently for some Eastman kids and they were talking about the, how much more acute the pressure is for auditions. And certainly I can empathize with that idea oh too. Oh my gosh. But is it, <laughs> yeah. is the, for, so for in your career, have you felt that the audition anxiety or sorry, performance anxiety is across all the parts of your playing and that you have to manage it? Or is it really context dependent on what kind of performance it is? Yeah, that's a great question. For me, um, at this point, I would say for sure the highest amount of anxiety I'll experience is for auditions. It's really impossible to avoid, even if, I mean, I, I figured it would get easier once I had a job to go take auditions and I'd say, well, it doesn't really matter because, you know, I have a job. But of course, essentially nerves is just an accumulation of energy it's just a whole bunch of energy surging through your body. So what I had to learn was just how to channel that. And I mean, that's sort of what um, a lot of performance psychology is about is just figuring out where you are, where you need to be um, sort of emotionally, mentally, energetically, and how to get there. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, I think it, it was also really important for me to learn and to accept that, you know, nothing no audition is going to be perfect. So, you know, I used to really start to beat myself up if I had a mistake or my hand slipped off the harp or something. And I sort of, I would say maybe, maybe crash and burn on an excerpt, but something doesn't go as well as I wanted to. And then suddenly it's just a steady slope, you know, cause I can't get out of that. Mm -hmm. Um, so I, so I think for auditions, that's still the, the, probably the, the biggest source of energy, but I, I'll i just continue to focus on breathing and relaxing my muscles. That's the biggest thing, just constantly releasing and then just getting into my sound and just burrowing in there so deeply that I, that even when those crazy thoughts come by, because of course they do, they always do. <laughs> I mean, like the other day I was playing something for, I was actually playing on a virtual convocation for University of Denver and I was, I was the only person who dared to play live. So suddenly I hop on the Zoom call and I see there are like 300 people on the call and I was like, oh, this is like, a real performance and of course I'm teaching my students about performance psychology so I'm like oh I really better not mess up <laughs> right um so in that moment I start playing for convocation and, and again I'm thinking about everyone who's present and my students watching and I just start thinking like oh my gosh what if I just threw the harp over what if it just I just absolutely pushed it over and got out of my seat you know or like what if what if I just you know started playing some crazy piece or what you know or or you know just the bait you know and, and those thoughts will continue to come in so then my job as a performer is just to not engage just to to say okay thank you very much and come back thank you very much mm -hmm. okay and to not get mad at yourself for thinking these things because they're gonna happen and you know so now I just tried to respond with almost <laughs> a, a sense of awkward delight I'm like oh thank you <laughs> and then to come back because otherwise I think once you start engaging it's it gets really difficult it's it's actually why I I'm starting to really love meditation and why that is such a helpful thing because the job there is again to just not engage you just let it go let it go yeah I found a relatively recent practice of meditation has been has paid dividends for me both both as a performer 
but also as a, a section leader and thinking about oh, yeah. like, what is it that I want to talk about? Like what, cause I have to run through a kind of a filter of what I'm hearing and what I need to address or what I want to address versus what I need to address. And if I just let my kind of emotions guide the, guide the show, then I would say everything that comes into my mind, which would be incredibly, <laughs> incredibly unhelpful for all involved, <laughs> believe me. Yeah. You know, and you know, the orchestra thing, and maybe this is different, obviously it's different from instrument to instrument, but I think we all have it to some ex- extent that, you know, you know that, that saying about combat, it's like mostly boredom punctuated by moments of sheer terror, that there's something <laughs> like that in, in I love playing, that. like second violin, like there's a lot of just calm, you're in, the, you're in the low in the mix, you're playing with other people, you're kind of in the groove, you're in the pocket, and then like out of nowhere, you have to do something. And in that moment, it, the, the dichotomy of the brief exposure out of the mix, it can be a very unsettling experience. And I, I've had to learn how to manage that. Oh my gosh, exactly. And that's totally like life of a harpist there is a lot of the time we are, yeah, just in the mix, you know, or maybe we're just sitting, right? Mm-hmm. Maybe for a long time. <laughs> so then being able to like hop back on the horse, you know, in time, I always talk about it as like, um, there was this movie that came out a while ago. It was about like horse jumping, which I didn't know existed, but it's, I'm, I'm going to have to figure out what it's called. But basically it's a story of a woman who rides horses off of a waterfall and they jump into, you know, the body of water together. And it's some sort of a sport. And it's a, it's a tricky thing because the horse starts running with you not on it. And then in the middle of the sprint to the waterfall, the person has to jump on in time and, and catch the horse. So that's often what I think about what we're doing when we're playing an orchestra is waiting, 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 catch the rhythm, catch the rhythm, mm-hmm. hop on. <laughs> and then it's like, go, 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 go. <laughs> Especially where you are on stage too, the distance. I mean, where I sit, I have the best seat in the house. Like I've got no excuse, <laughs> in ter- particularly in terms of rhythm. <laughs> no, but it's it's a totally different thing too, and also having to follow more, you know, because you're always going to be following. I mean, unless of course you're doing your own thing, but adapting to the first violin section is huge. I mean, playing second harp is one of the hardest things that I've I've done. So, um, you know, because it's you getting inside of someone else's sound while Mm -hmm. also watching the conductor and listening. It's, it's amazing. So going back to your time at Juilliard and at the new world symphony, you're kind of steeped in a culture and an experience of experimentation. So you probably brought that to the table somewhat, but you were also formed by those institutions. Can you tell me about and you, you talked a little bit about what you learned at Juilliard, but tell me about what you learned at New World in terms of the 20, like a 21st century vision of what orchestras and classical musicians can be. Oh my gosh. Yeah. I mean, my experience at the New World Symphony absolutely changed my life. Um, I mean, first of all, as a harpist, getting to have the experience to basically be, have an orchestra job, you know, to play week in, week out, all that repertoire was, was so amazing. But beyond that, it, you know, it was really the context in which we were performing and the really innovative concert formats that the New World Symphony has created. Um, and, you know, it's really interesting because as, as you know, you know, being in Louisville and working with Teddy, you know, another New World alum and uh, just such a, such a leader, a huge part of what they do there is t- to, you know, take risks, um, but not just uh, random risks. They take really calculated, mitigated risks based on their audience uh, feedback and focus groups and surveys. And so what I love about this is that they've not only connected with their audiences in a, in a, in a much deeper way, but they acknowledge that there are many different audiences out there. It's not just, um, you know, pops and fills, you know, it is people who like shorter concerts, it's people who like chamber music, it's people who like to interact maybe before or after the concert, or maybe they just want to sit outside and watch a big, a big simulcast, you know? Um, so being able to 
um, have different offerings for different audiences, um, they have actually proven will build you an audience. They have done that time and time and time again. So it's really inspiring. And I mean, I think a lot of orchestras will say, okay, well, that's great that they can do that, but come on, they're not a real orchestra. They don't have the union. Um, they are technically an educational institution. And yes, all of that is very true. And they do play a big factor in their ability to experiment. Nevertheless, the data that they have produced from over a decade of this, you know, alternative concert formats has not only proven that this can build audiences, but they have actually shared it with mm -hmm. other orchestras, you know, all over the country who have successfully implemented their techniques and uh, created new communities of classical music lovers. So that seeing that in action was the most inspiring thing and it's been challenging actually leaving there because of course the rest of the country has the you know it's a very diverse ecosystem of orchestras and really interesting unique histories um and you know like rochester is amazing because we have so much history and with that comes a real connection to tradition and absolutely you know so we need to preserve that at the same time we need to be able to um create and expand our offerings for you know the 21st century audience so it's been really amazing to work towards that. Hmm. There is a bit of a double-edged sword with tradition in that. This is speculative on my part, so I don't pretend that this isn't, I know this empirically, but I look around the country and our peers and our uh, sister organizations around the country that are uh, going through the same thing as all Americans are. And the Rochester Philharmonic on one hand, we have this great tradition. We're almost a hundred years old. Yeah. And I can't help but think that that lineage is not in some way responsible for us coming back this season when we could have simply folded up the tents because there are wealthier organizations that are younger than we are that just waved the white flag and they said nope <laughs> we're, we're not coming back after until until this is all over yeah. that's an amazing thing to be a part of where the instinct of the institution is to get back to work as soon as possible and keep going the flip side of it, of course, is that the pull of the status quo is very, very heavy. So I'm curious if you might speculate a little bit on, this isn't Rochester specific at all, but like, why has it been so hard, do you think, for the lessons of New World to permeate our industry as a whole? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think a part of it is that if you haven't gone down there and seen the New World Center for yourself, mm -hmm. it's honestly impossible to believe that this place actually exists. I think that's a part of it. Um, and I mean, uh, there are still many people who, you know, maybe haven't been exposed to this kind of thing, or maybe they're just really drawn to what they have always done. You know, there is safety in familiarity. And so I think the people who are generally making the decisions, again, will probably come from boards. Um, the people on these boards for, you know, various orchestras are from a different age. And mm -hmm. so again, if they haven't seen Seen anything different or they haven't experienced it, you know, why change something, you know, um, unnecessarily. I think the other part of it is that it does take an initial investment in this, you know, um, creating these new concerts um, requires, yeah, in, investing in a new kind of development, you know, probably a, a younger friends group, you know, and, and maybe there's a post-concert drink involved and you know and maybe it's that we have more videos and we hire videographers and um you know so just have having the resources to change is not easy um so i think it's just about you know sort of taking baby steps towards that and at least finding support among the board like part of the reason we're so lucky here in rochester is that we have amazing board members like uh, Dr. George Schwartz, you know, who just, he, he supported the orchestra for years. He came in this year. He loved our live streams. And he said, you know, absolutely. I would, I would fund one of these personally, you know? Mm -hmm. So he funded that amazing 19th amendment concert we did at the Susan B. Anthony house. And so that all of our community could, could enjoy it. So I think it's, it's really inspiring to see people hopping on that bandwagon and saying, yeah, we can do this. Mm -hmm. And we are really, really lucky. I completely agree. Um, I think one of the strengths in 
in Rochester and, and really all over is classical music can be accessed and enjoyed in so many new formats. Um, and so the more that we can change the way that we present it, the more people we can reach. Yeah, I, I agree wholeheartedly. I think that the asymmetry comes from in New World, there is the funding, and the, the, the overall budget relative to the size of the, the musician's line in the budget is actually quite asymmetric to the rest of the country. And that gives them some room to experiment that I don't know the rest of us have right at the moment. And totally. so, but I'm going to, as you were talking, I, I had two recollections. So I got a former boss, the late, great James DePriest. <gasps> I remember him telling yes. us in Phoenix that he said, a crisis is no time to do cartwheels on the precipice. The point being like, don't get too fancy if you're on yeah. the verge of crisis. The flip side of it though, of course, is when we were on that little radio show on XXI with Teddy Abrams, and he talked about how you have to expect and embrace a certain amount of failure. And that if anything, this is the yes. time that it's essential. So what I wonder, going back to your words a minute ago about baby steps, maybe this isn't the time though for baby steps. Maybe this is mm -hmm. the time for like a full throttled approach <laughs> Um, into the future. <laughs> yeah. When you think about this vision for uh, a more communally experienced orchestra, one that's for everybody, that is putting out its message of inspiration and, and uplift in every place possible. If you had a $10 million war chest with which to go to battle and change the status quo in your home institution, how might that look? Mm, what a juicy question. <laughs> it's like if you were given a million dollars and your own private island. <laughs> well, I mean, in some um, ways you think about that is, that is not an inconceivable amount of funding. It's unlikely, <laughs> right? It's, uh, it's unlikely yeah. that we're going to get a $10 million gift, but it's not an inconceivable amount of money to go to work with if no. you wanted to turn around in an organization. Especially too, because often the situation is that um, I think in order to ask for money for something or you know, whatever it is, a grant or a private gift, you need to ask for something specific. You need to know what that thing is. So it's, it's really a great question. So I think for here, one of the biggest uses, I, well, I think it's really two categories that I would invest in personally. And one of them is media, um, technology, not only in the concert hall, um, but also in the ability to stream to schools, to um, homes, uh, you know, nursing homes, um, any community center, um, and to share our concerts, not in person. Because, I mean, I think another thing we're realizing is that there is a huge audience base out there and we can reach people who are not in Rochester. And yes, even if you're not in Rochester, you probably do want to hear the Rochester Philharmonic Orchestra because we're a great orchestra. So um, it would not only dramatically increase our accessibility locally, but also, you know, nationally and beyond. So I think that reach component is huge. The other big thing that we could invest in would be education and education in, in different forms. So um, obviously like what the first thing we think of is, you know, kids concerts and those are fantastic. We had, as you know, the most amazing final concert in Kodak Hall where we live streamed for the very first time, the first week of COVID and we reached, you know, thousands and thousands of students. And that was their last experience in school before COVID. So um, that was an incredible triumph that I think we can build on because we can continue to reach schools in that way. And I think when we can eventually continue in-person work, we can and should build more integrated residencies with these schools to develop real partnerships um, to not only help with, you know, just the basic music appreciation, but um, instructional learning and ensemble playing, because look at how many of us are teachers and coaches. Mm -hmm. um, the other kind of education that's also really huge is that I think we can have a, a sort of a series that would be not just playing, but really, truly interactive. 
one of, well, one of the questions you had asked me originally was, you know, are there books that you would recommend? And um, I always, always talk about the amazing work of Dr. David Wallace. Um, he was a senior teaching artist at the New York Philharmonic. And he actually is now Dean of Strings at the Berkeley School of Music. So just one of the most phenomenal educators. But when I, I happened to take a class with him at Juilliard called uh, Arts and Education. And I had no idea what I was getting into, but basically I learned what a music teaching artist is and how they are basically the keys to making music accessible for any and every audience, especially adults. I want to press you on that a little bit. So part of what I, I brought the $10 million number up because that was a, the sum of money that my wife's former orchestra, the Indianapolis Symphony got from the Eli Lilly Foundation. It's a specific amount of money to solve certain problems. This is a number of years ago, like wow. five years ago. So obviously we don't have something like Eli Lilly here in Rochester, but if we had that kind of money to solve a, a problem, we, I want to talk about, you know, hardware, investment, mm. hiring, training of musicians, <laughs> an endowment for free, free performances for uh, the people that might not otherwise be able to come and see us or hear us and education in initiatives. But that brings me to the idea of the teaching artists. So in an organization yeah. like the New York Philharmonic, our friends downstate, they have an enormous budget, obviously, and they have an enormous staff and enormous resources, although they're one of the groups that are not playing this year. However, in a place like Rochester, which is more the norm, right? There's more Ixom orchestras that look like us than look like the New York Philharmonic. So for most yeah. of us out there across the country, do you think that the investment would be better spent on making the existing personnel and our new hires that come in, um, testing for that and training them to be teaching artists? Or is it better to have people that specialize in that because we do have teaching artists here in our city that work for other organizations. Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, like what would that really look like? I honestly, it's funny because when I was getting ready to leave the New World Symphony, I was desperately afraid that I wasn't going to win a job anywhere. So I actually went back to them and said, hey, can you hire me as a teaching artist? <laughs> and I put up a whole proposal of the things I would do. And I realized pretty quickly that this would absolutely be a full-time job. And here's why. A teaching artist, even just one teaching artist at the RPO, for example, could do a myriad of things. For one, obviously, they can head the education program and design um, curriculum and residencies for various schools. Uh, they can also um, produce all of the education concerts, you know, and collaborate with the amazing conductors we have. Um, you know, Herb Smith is already great at that. Herb is, you know, obviously we, I know you had him on the podcast recently. Um, he, he is also a great teaching artist. So that just came through in spades when, when he conducted. Um, the other thing that teaching artists can do is to present um, the pre-concert talks, you know, pre or post concert to, um, to, to uh, give audiences a taste of what they're about to experience. And even furthermore, to help design events in which the programming and the theme of the event, the location, the food, all of that is, is, is intertwined to create really um, an immersive experience. Um, so it's just basically putting the creative musical juices in every section of the organization. I think that's what a teaching artist could do. That's an interesting analysis. I think that's, I think that's dead on because we, if anything, in most aspects of life, we underestimate how long something is going to take. So we assume that like one of our cellists or principal second violin <laughs> can do this thing on the side and maybe even volunteer for it and then just become completely overwhelmed by right. the responsibilities of it. That made me think though that with so much of the work we're doing now being online, there is a, a sense that we're going to be able to uh, touch audiences that are outside of our locale. But what's striking me about this conversation is that so much of this work that you're talking about in this reimagination really is locally focused. Yeah. And I mean, I guess really I should add to the description that I provided earlier to say that at the same time, you could totally adapt this position for COVID times. For example, 
designing the social media content that we put out there is huge. I mean, um, not to mention figuring out how to market the concerts we're doing. I mean, finding the entry point, you know, <laughs> that's exactly what a teaching artist can do. So, you know, I think it would be even more powerful to have that person involved in, um, in all sorts of media production. And then like you're saying to train others to have that, because I mm -hmm. think the, the best, um, the best entry point that, you know, is it's always from the music. If you try to superimpose something else on top of it, it sort of diminishes what we have or, you know, sort of distracts from it. We have to actually be able to lean in to what we're programming, even if it's Schoenberg and Berg. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah, guess what? Schoenberg was a crazy expressionist guy. And let's put some klempt up to look at while you're listening to this and, you know, and share stories of his life. I mean, you can dig into anything when you find when you find the in. Mm -hmm. As I was saying about the pull of the status quo, I can totally have empathy for our leadership. When I say our, I mean our national leadership, because when you're, when you are on that precipice, it's really scary to mess with something that's working, even if it's only working by the skin of its teeth. Yep. And to be, to risk derailing that, with small changes, I can under, I can really appreciate the the reticence to do that. I think the musicians yeah. we have a similar thing that we need to look at in terms of our audition process, which is it works. The audition process as it exists is imperfect, but it largely works. In that, when we put right. an ad in the paper, we usually make a really good hire, and we're good to go. But do you see a way or foresee a future where when we test people for their instrumental skills, we're also testing them for their, what other skills they might bring, what potential passions they might have, and also their coachability, right? Their ability to learn new things on the job. Is that something that you foresee in our, in our processes going forward? That is a great question. And I know we, a lot of people have been reflecting on the audition process recently, especially in light of, you know, Black Lives Matter. And there have been some amazing um, articles and essays written by, you know, our friends Titus Underwood and Nashville Symphony, um, Anthony McGill um, and Damari McGill. And, you know, um, just um, a lot of really good questions. And while we understand, of course, that blind auditions are there to preserve the musical integrity of the experience, I think we can all agree that the 21st century musician, even the orchestral musician, needs to have other skills um, to bring to the table. So what I would love is if we did everything sort of as we do it, um, except that when we get to the final round and the screen comes down, we you know, we not only look at um, so the person's resume, but we talk to them and talk to them about, you know, what their experiences are, um, what they have been, you know, how they view the orchestral world and what other skills they have. Because, I mean, it's hard to measure those things. It's hard to ask for those. And so I think what might also need to happen is that our contracts as musicians starts to involve um, and maybe it's optional at first, but optional outreach add-ons, development add-ons, um, marketing add-ons, um, because I, I think, yeah, it's not enough to just to assign that to someone in management. Um, I think we need to be able to work on this stuff together. Outside of New World and uh, maybe to a certain extent, Juilliard, who out there is doing work that you really admire? either as an individual artist or as an institution? Yeah, great question. Um, I've been really inspired um, by the Philadelphia Orchestra. Um, I guess I'm, I'm on their email list. Um, I think I, I bought a ticket once a, a while ago. I, I got to play with them for what was gonna be their opening night in, what was it, 2016? And it happened to be the night that they went on strike. Mm -hmm. <laughs> So we didn't end up playing. Um, thankfully, they more than recovered from that. And I mean, talk about resilience, you know, um, with Yannick Nézé-Séguin as their music director. Um, he has just been so brilliant at 
creating virtual opportunities for the orchestra and the musicians. Um, he was one of the first conductors, um, I think, what, in, in Montreal to um, actually start recording again with the ensemble. Um, and again, everyone's socially distant, everyone's in masks. Um, and then in Philly, um, you know, he was able to, you know, with, with management and the musicians, they curated a lot of content that went just beyond performances. It was, you know, Q and A's with, uh, you know, guest artists. It was master classes. It's video clips of different musicians playing along to Beethoven five, you know, so you can hear their parts differently and really just making the most of what we can do. You know, mm -hmm. I think a lot of people, of course, are just sitting around saying, well, we can't do this. We can't do that. We can't do this. We can't do that. But they're saying, well, but we can do this <laughs> and adding to that every month. And they've had an endless stream of content ever since, you know, March 15th. It's just, it's really inspiring. So your, your first job was in the Dallas Opera and you are also, also are still currently a member of the Santa Fe Opera. So can you compare and contrast the cultures of, of the symphony orchestra and opera? How, how are they the same and how are they different? Oh, yeah, that's a great question. Um, I never thought that I would be in an opera pit it's really funny, but I, I didn't grow up listening to opera. Um, you know, I didn't even think I really liked it, but I got the chance to play La Boheme like a bunch of times. And after the first very shaky performance, I eventually was like, wow, this is, this is intense. I like it. Okay. And then, you know, flash forward to 2014, I'm about to leave New World and there's an opening in Dallas Opera. So I, you know, I go out there and again, I'm playing on a different harp and it's actually my first time in Texas. <laughs> and um, luckily in the final round, they just asked for two things. They asked for magic fire music, which is probably the hardest excerpt we have. It's like a pedal tap dance and three excerpts from La Boheme. So I was like, hey, I got this. <laughs> so um, getting in there was really interesting because again, I, my goal before that was like symphony orchestra, symphony orchestra. I just, I love being on stage and I love the orchestra rep, but then I get down in the pit and I realize, you know, this music is some of the most challenging and most beautiful of anything I'd ever played. And as a harpist, I was way more involved. Like, I mean, I feel like I, you know, I, I get my feet wet, you know, when I'm, when I'm on stage here, but in the pit, it's a totally different game. And it is like my first opera there was Salome for goodness sake. I mean, it was like <laughs> trial by fire. Right. So I, I loved it. And, um, I would say that, um, my experience there was amazing. I, what I noticed in, in a lot of opera orchestras, there's really this feeling of family, you are hunkered together, down under, and at the same time, it's not really about us, you know, mm -hmm. it's really more about what's going on on stage. And, and, and so we, you know, have to cater to that. And with that comes this sense of this, this sort of chill um, vibe, even at the, you know, in the, in the, the, the Met Orchestra, when I played there, I mean, things, uh, I, I, I subbed for a performance of Carmen and in one of the rehearsals, um, oh, pardon me. In a performance, actually, Carmen was excited and she was dancing and she accidentally knocked a cup off stage and it like flew into the pit and actually hit the harp and sort of bounced around and everyone was like, whoa, whoa you know, and everyone got up and they're like, hey, you okay? You all right? Everything okay? You know, everyone checks on each other and then they just keep playing. Mm -hmm. <laughs> So there's this really lovely atmosphere. Um, but the only thing that um, I think the biggest difference between Dallas and Santa Fe is that the Santa Fe Opera, it, it's all, it's on this beautiful, beautiful outdoor campus where the opera singers and the musicians and the staff and, and all the stage crew and everything, we're all working together in the same shared space. Basically, we have a cafeteria, we have this, you know, um, nice big backstage area. So we would actually see each other more. What I noticed at, you know, at the Met and, and in Dallas was that um, the, the musicians are really quite a bit more separated mm -hmm. from the singers. And with that comes a little bit of, it's almost like, you know, first class, second class citizens, you know, <laughs> like it's, um, you know, obviously the singers are going to mm -hmm. always get 
the um the most attention but like in santa fe for example the orchestra is always invited to all the receptions which is amazing so we really feel like we are just as important as the singers it's this sort of beautiful utopian vibe so i really love that mm -hmm. obviously there's a, such a visual element to opera and for a long time you know as you can see, if you go on YouTube, whenever we have to play, there's so many, there's many, many different ver versions to watch online. So in other words, opera is more comfortable in the visual medium than we are in recorded visual medium. Do you think they have an advantage over us in going forward if they are, were going to stream more or put more of their content online? Is, I mean, is there a comparative advantage in opera already? That's a good question. I would say the only advantage would be for orchestras who have already recorded, like the Met, for example. I mean, they were very fortunate that, of course, they have this beautiful, you know, endless archive of, you know, the Met in HD. So, but at the same time, it's also created sort of a reluctance to adapt. So here they are sort of hanging on to the same performances and continuing mm -hmm. to stream them while they furloughed their entire orchestra mm -hmm. and they're not employing anyone. So um, I, I really got to hand it to the Santa Fe Opera. Um, I'm, I'm on the orchestra committee right now. And while the, this past summer was, you know, really tough, you know, we of course had to amend our contract and everything. And ultimately the season was canceled, but we're already in discussions for summer of 2021 and they are doing everything they can possibly do to keep things going. I mean, one of the biggest advantages that we have is, of course, that we are outdoors. We have an outdoor theater. I mean, mm -hmm. that is a total game changer. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, I think it is, it's just, it's hard for opera, much harder for opera right now because singers are unfortunately uh, a safety hazard, you know, unless, unless they're going to be, you know, w shielding up and everything. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. It's the most, what they say, it's as much aerosol as like yelling. <laughs> Yeah, well, I imagine. But, you know, Grace, I was actually thinking more about oh. um, the programming itself. So people watch a lot of opera in video form, probably much yeah. more so than they watch um, symphony orchestras. And so oh, I was just yeah. wondering if that you think that those organizations are already more primed to take it to have an online presence. But I think you answered the question. Um, oh, I, yeah, right. Because it's, it, yeah, basically, I think it's a fantastic tool um, to, to do that. And, and you're right, because it is, it is more visual. Um, but I mean, with orchestras, I think the opportunities to stream and to experience an orchestra virtually, I would argue is maybe just as engaging as you know watching opera singers on stage because there's a totally different kind of drama happening, mm -hmm. and um, I mean it's 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 not the same form by any means, but I think um, streaming gives us the chance to really shape how a person experiences a live orchestra visually. What are they looking at? Um, how are, how does the videography help to bring out the musical interpretation of the piece? You know, I mean, you can do, I mean, obviously we've seen what like Sun Valley music festival did with, with their video work. So I think it's, um, it's definitely a great, a great opportunity for any organization to think about how to represent themselves in a, in a new visual way. And as we go forward with this, and let's say, I think we have an amazing opportunity, even if there were a vaccine tomorrow, I think we have an amazing opportunity to keep building on this infrastructure that we're putting together to, to create visual performances. How do you think it might affect the programming choices? I mean, is there a, I mean, maybe a Mahler symphony is not the best thing <laughs> uh, to stream right just out of its like length and you know uh, but is there an opportunity right. to maybe change our programming and if so to what end mm. i think it would not be a bad idea to consider shortening our programs ever so slightly. Um, I mean, I definitely love having an intermission. I think it's, it's an important part of a social experience when you're all together to go out and have a drink. And, um, you know, I mean, that, that's, uh, that's a wonderful thing. But 
I think even when we are, we are in the hall, it's still a lot to ask of people um, to give an entire evening, you know, two and a half hours, let's say, to, to a concert experience. Um, and of course, that's especially true if we're talking about virtually, you know, as screen time is at the front of our minds. I mean, I just got a notification on my phone today that said my, that my screen time was an average of 10 hours and 30 minutes last week. I mean, that is... That's crazy, right? <laughs> so I'm like, so I, I just, I feel like we can do more with less, you know? Um, and one of the things that I loved, loved, loved about the New World Symphony was how often they would incorporate visuals into their performances. So, you know, for example, they, 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 they had three full-time videographers on staff. So these videographers would create these you know, brilliant musical um, visual interpretations of the music. Let's say it's, um, you know, pictures at an exhibition. Well, they would pair the performance with visuals sort of uh, exploring the painting and telling the story more or less. And it doesn't, it, it can be as specific or as general as you want, even just the suggestion of, you know, just ha getting to look at a gnome while you're listening to the movement gnomus, <laughs> you know, is going to completely change the listening experience um so i think it would um it's just it's a great opportunity to just think about the the quality of the production that we're doing to add more to it to make it even more engaging to have let's say um little interviews between pieces you know almost like um maybe like a sporting event mm -hmm. would be you know yeah i think that one of the status quo problems we have is that as as players, anyone that's in the business that's very close to it, we're not super attuned to the way most people, I think, experience concerts and outside of our own. In other words, maybe our audience is likely not just attending only classical music concerts. They're likely attending a whole bunch of other live events, musical and otherwise. And some of those have a much more dialed in concert experience. Um, you know Scott Harrison? He's a he's I, been a CEO of a number of orchestras. He's a wonderful guy and super smart. Oh, but he okay, um, look him up. he used to talk about uh, a, an audience's bill of rights. You know, because there was that time where we we're talking about like a passenger's bill of rights on airlines, and like a number of things that would be built in that an audience member could expect each time. And I think one mm. of those things is length. I think that the the concerts are just too long, and then. <laughs> And then depending on the situation of your concessions, the line for a cocktail could be, you know, it could be in Phoenix. It was unbelievable how long those lines could get. Um, oh, that's just torture. And then you finally get it and then you have to chug it and go back inside. Yeah, I remember. Or that was, I, I, I singled out Phoenix because I, I just had a memory. But I remember in Louisville um, going out in the lobby during a concert with the Indigo Girls. And the oh, line, I love them. They, they were they were great. They put in an amazing show, and the place was packed, and people were so, to use your word, they were so uplifted and inspired by that performance. But I went out at the intermission just to take a look out in the audience, and the lines for the concessions were just inconceivably long. Um, so these these things that are so apart from the music can have such an impact on the way people what their overall takeaway from the experience might actually be. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, a new world would always say is it's really not about the concert itself. It's about the concert experience from the minute you walk in the door or I guess, you know, open your computer screen. Mm -hmm. um, you know, you, you really need to almost feel like you are hosting this person, you know? Mm -hmm. um, and I think another thing that we've learned in this time is how important that social interaction is. Like when we finally got to move the living room series outdoors and we got to play for our audience again, and even just having that 15 minutes afterwards to, you know, with our masks, just say, you know, hi to someone in the, in the audience um, and for them to see each other um is is huge i mean that's what community is, is really about so um i think the i think it would be great to see more of the smaller group experiences i know that i think there's sort of a fear maybe that unions have you know rightfully so that orchestras might say hey if we can charge as much for chamber concerts then why should we employ a full orchestra but you know no one's ever going to get sick of the full orchestra nothing can ever replace that we just have to have other 
options too, it's because then people can see us in a different way. You know, we are very, we're a very versatile group. And I think, you know, the more that we can get out of our hall um, and play in new places and for people to see us at a brewery or at a park, you know, to know that like we're here and we're accessible and we're part of the community, you know, is, is everything. Yeah. I, I only interject that. I, I agree with you that few people would probably tire of the big orchestra, but what people tire of is funding it. <laughs> you know, like, oh, you right. know, like the, the, the heavy lift that goes into that year in and year out and that, and that's, but that's probably a problem that won't ever really be solved. I mean, it's just, it's kind of baked into the, into the, into the ingredients list. Right. Grace, I think this is a good place to wrap up. You already gave us one recommendation. Do you have a couple of others? Oh, Wait, yeah. And just to clear, I don't actually know if I gave you the title of his book. So that was my bad. But my teaching artist, um, Dr. David Wallace, he has a fantastic book called Engaging the Concert Audience. Um, I loved it so much. I actually carried it around in my purse for like two years and I would just like show it to like anyone I met. So I love it because again, he really breaks it down into what an interactive concert really is. You know, a lot of people would say, oh yeah, it's just where the person plays and they talk from the stage and then afterwards they ask questions, you know, <laughs> but no, there's a whole lot more that the audience can do, you know, so he really lays it out for you and gives fantastic, creative, beautiful examples. Um, so I love that. Um, the other thing I was thinking a lot about recently, because I just got back from this very long road trip, I listened to probably like 15 hours of podcasts. And um, I really, really loved listening to a recent podcast. You know, Brene Brown has a, a, new, a new pod called uh, Unlocking Us. And the episode I listened to it was by the authors of a new book called Burnout. And they're two sisters. And I, I, have you heard about this? I haven't. It's totally amazing. I think it must be very, very new, but um, it's written by two sisters. And one of the sisters is actually a classically trained musician. Um, and what they talk about is um, basically all of the um, factors, you know, in society that lead to emotional stress and how emotional stress creates, you know, physical implications on the body and, you know, and, and just how to really fully experience our, um, our emotions and to process them. So, because essentially they, they, they define burnout as a state where you are stuck in one emotion for too long. So anyway, it's brilliant. And there are, again, a lot of insights on our world because we have someone here who's a, who's a musician. So that was awesome. Um, and then because it's <laughs> nice to laugh, um, I just watched Borat's new movie last night and it is amazing. <laughs> full of surprises. Um, but ultimately very heartwarming, you know, to see him reunite with his daughter and, um, you know, um, focusing on the, the things that really make America great. <laughs> <laughs> well, this podcast will be published hopefully right before election day. So take that Ooh. movie and get to the polls. Yep. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's right. Everybody vote. Everybody vote. Um, and um, yeah, and Rob, you are the best. Um, we are so lucky to have you here in Rochester. Really, I talk to like everyone I, I know about um, how, how great you are and please never leave. Um. <laughs> <laughs> well, Grace, uh, I'm going to record a, an introduction as you know to this, but you've been an incredible inspiration uh, through this time. And it's an interesting thing to think about how you know, some people can fit themselves to the times, like they can adapt, they can see the, the playing field and, and drop the plays that are needed. But there's also the person who was sort of born for the times, like their particular set of skills are inherently more valuable. And it seems that you're one of the people that has used this crisis to not only improve yourself, but to lift up an organization and make them see what's possible. Um, I will give more specifics in the introduction about the things you accomplished, but it has been a that remarkable run. So much. And whatever we were able to accomplish this year as an orchestra is in no small part to the hard work that you put in since, since March. So thank you. Oh, that means so much, Rob. I mean, 
gosh, I, I just, you know, every day I'm just like, we're so lucky we get to do this for a living. That's you amazing. know, it's a great way to make a living. We're so fortunate. And I mean, and what a great group we have, man. I mean, we just, this, this community is, is so amazing. And, and again, and I've just, I've loved seeing everyone that you're bringing on the podcast and including some RPO musicians and just, you know, helping to again, lift up all, all of these great people in our network. So yeah, bravo to you. And I'm excited for lots more adventures to come. Thank you, Grace. <laughs> Thanks, Rob. Thank you for listening. The music on the show, as always, is by Craig Wagner, an incredible guitarist from Louisville, Kentucky. We'll be back soon with more interviews, so please go ahead and hit subscribe.